the Institute of the Local Governments, as well as the Institute of Disability Inclusion and Care of the Universidad de de Recoleta and the Transnational Institute, give you the warmest welcome to the International Seminar, New Constitution in Chile, the right of care workers and the right to be cared for towards a feminist care system. This international seminar offers the opportunity for the international audience to find out more about the debate regarding the importance of a national care system with a feminist approach in the framework of the constitutional process in Chile, which is a very important discussion for Chile, Latin America and the entire world. with a very important uh, speakers. They will speak about how the Chilean process opens up the possibility of guaranteeing care workers and the right to be cared for, as well as the creation of a national system of care with a feminist approach. Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome, everyone, to this international seminar organized by the Institute of Local Governments and also Universidad Abierta de Recoleta, as well as the Transnational Institute. Before we give the welcome to our panel members, we're going to introduce you to this firm, which is called New Constitution in Chile, the right of care workers and the right to be cared for towards a national care system with a feminist approach. The feminist demands in Chile have been going on for quite some time from women like Elena Cafarena that fought for the right to vote in the middle of the 20th century with the movement for the emancipation of women as well as the slogan, democracy in the country and home and in bed promoting by feminists in the 80s until the latest feminist wave in 2008 with thousands of women mobilizing against um, sexist violence. The demands have been moving forward along the decades and now the feminist agenda covers topics just like the elimination of sexist violence, the elimination of the pay gap which still exists in Chile, the guaranteeing of reproductive rights, non-sexist education, among others. In this context, the demands for the rights of care workers and the right to be cared for cannot be seen outside the feminist demands. The seminar will try to approach these issues from the feminist economic perspective as well, tackling the issue of migration when we talk about care workers, also economic inequalities, and especially the recognition of the housework and care work as a non-paid work. The latest motto is, it's not love, it's unpaid work, has been one of the feminist demands which is now embraced by the constitution where this is also the first uh, paritary constitution in the world and many women who are feminists are trying to push this forward and hopefully we're going to move on at all the levels. And that is what we are going to address today and we are going to welcome our guests. We have Claudia Pascual. Hi, Claudia. Congratulations, first of all, elected senator, also the first minister of the women's ministry. She's a social anthropologist, also a member of political parties since she was 13. She's a communist, she's a feminist. She was part of the Council of Santiago. She was elected for that position twice. Then she was the minister of the women's service. And then she was the first minister of of the Ministry of Women and Gender Equality. In this ministry, she promoted the legalization of abortion under three causes and ending the binominal system with a gender equality approach. As a senator in the metropolitan region, she wants to promote a more efficient parliament committed with a constitutional process and a Senate that puts at the core of its work the quality of life of Chileans, promoting a participative and and uh, equal participation with the approach of human rights, hopefully to repay the debt that still exists to women and other minorities. We're happy to have you today. And also we have Paula Paulette, 
Today, who is part of the team that works with the presidential candidate of the second round of election, Mr. Gabriel Voris. She is in charge of the agenda of the national care system. She is an economist and minor in sociology of the Catholic University, also a master's degree in public policies of the University of Chile. And she has worked doing research in different places in the National Council of Culture and Arts, the Central Bank. She's also part of Comunidad Mujer. And she has been the director of this research center for a couple of years now. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. We also have with us Paloma Olivares, who is the regional coordinator and also chief of staff of the uh, conventional uh, member, Mrs. Bray, and part of the organization Yo Cuido that works with caregivers or care workers along the country. Hi, Paloma, how are you? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. Well, I just want to mention that we also had Mercedes de Alessandra as a guest, who is the director of economy, gender equality in the Ministry of Economy of Argentina. But unfortunately, Mercedes is at this moment in the conversation of the national budget together with the minister. We know that those negotiations are very difficult regardless of the country. So I hope that Paula and Claudia know the experience of Argentina and they know Marcel. So if you would like to refer to that case, as we were going to address it here, you're welcome to do so. Without further ado, I would like to tell you what this is going to be about. We are going to be asking three questions regarding the care system, regarding the new constitution, and regarding a care system with a feminist approach. We are going to be asking all three of you the questions, and each of you will have a couple of minutes, four minutes, to answer the questions. And after that, we are going to take questions from the audience. So let's begin as a first question. How do you think domestic work and care work should be acknowledged considering the social and economic importance that they have? What other international experiences there are around this? And we would like to start with Claudia. Thank you, Carolina. Can you all hear me? Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, and thank you for joining. In relation to this question, I think that the first issue is to move on in something that Paula knows more about, maybe, because you have gone through the first experience in that, which is the recognition of this work with studies that would quantify the contribution to the national accounts. What is the actual contribution to the GDP of domestic work and also care work that women carry out with their families? And with that, in the feminist economy and in the feminist movement, there is a saying, which is that if you don't count it, it doesn't count. So first of all, we need to give visibility to what is the size of the contribution that takes place towards the GDP and that also allows the economic development of the countries, of course, and it allows above all the development of people that they are strengthened and that their spirit is renewed to go out there and to work and to conduct all the tasks that they need to do. And secondly, I think that we need to move forward. And of course, the project depends on whatever resources are available from the national budget. And in that sense, it's important to have public policies in place. And in this case, to reform certain things in our country, especially the system of tax collection of the country so that we are able to have better and more resources, of course, taxing those that earn the most, not only most of the population, but those that earn the most from the perspective of larger companies and also personal wealth. From that perspective, we need to pay. We need to pay people for this work and we have to move on as a country in having a salary. 
a salary for women family members who care for people and of course to generate an instance for recognition not only socially but also in this case financially and in the third place i think it is very important and we have had this conversation with Paula in a couple of meetings beforehand in, in different uh, instances to address the same issue, which is to be able to train, to educate in, in a more professional manner, people, men and women, in order to become care workers to care for people that require that service or that work. Let's call them at home helpers or assistants as it is in the program of the candidate Gabriel Boric, or let's call them community sort of watchers or caregivers or helpers, regardless of the name that we ultimately decide to use. But it's for those people that fulfill that duty to turn it into something more professionalized and from that perspective, I think that we can move on in assuming the social co-responsibility of the state and the community with these tasks and not only just leave it aside and to leave it at the hands of women because of the sexual division of labor and this idea that we follow in our society. And on the other hand, we're also going to be moving on in recovering the free time of women who care for others for them to rest because the work of caring for someone makes you tired makes you sick you need to have time available to take care of yourself to go to your doctor's appointments to have time for leisure for recreation time for you to develop yourself and and, and your life in a more comprehensive and fulfilled manner and we have to do that so that care workers get back their quality of life so that at the same time they are happier and they are more um, fulfilled with with the work that they've been conducting for so many years and that is all i have to say for now thank you claudia without a doubt there are many key points, financial recognition, and also to see how much does it represent in terms of the GDP? How much does the care work account for a tax reform, training people with social responsibility? There are so many concepts to consider. Paula, what do you think? Well, I fully agree with Claudia. And I would say that, well, it, this isn't just my opinion, but internationally, what happens around housework and non or unpaid work are the three R's in Spanish, reduction, redistribution and recognition. Regarding recognition, the international experience tells us that just like Claudia said it at the beginning, we need to conduct surveys to figure out how time is allocated and we have to uh, create accounts per household. The surveys to find out the time allocation are critical because they are the basic input to run different calculations. So Chile was actually one of the latest Latin American countries to start conducting the surveys. Actually, the, the first one was in 2015 and unfortunately it has has been the only one. And with that single survey, Comunidad Mujer, back when I was leading that process, conducted a measurement of the contribution of the care work to the GDP. And the most important finding that matches, of course, findings throughout the world is that the GDP or the contribution to the GDP of domestic and unpaid care work by 2015, which is when the survey was applied, was of 22%. That transforms domestic and unpaid care work in the most important economic activity of the country, most important than mining, than the banking industry, than trade, just pick any activity, unpaid domestic and care work is more important financially when it is measured, when we 
do the effort to measure. So to conduct the surveys and to set up the satellite accounts for the homes, that is the most important thing we have to do, first of all. And there are three other ways that in the world have been used. First, through pension systems. And we have something similar to that, which is that recognition through a bonus per child, but it lacks so much that we couldn't even say that it evens out the importance of this 22% that I mentioned earlier. So it is uh, an attempt of recognizing this unpaid labor, but it's not enough. And the other thing is the direct money transfers for care, which is to pay for. There are a number of countries that are far more developed than ours that depending on the level of of uh, reliance of the people that are cared for, it gives people that care for them a certain economic or financial compensation because precisely in the case of people that care for people that have heavy reliance they don't have any other option they just have to care for that person they cannot perform any other paid activity so they are compensated financially with an income in Chile, there is something that could be similar to that, but once again, it is not enough. It is just a bonus given by the health ministry, which is below 30,000 pesos a month. So we couldn't say that it comes near what's fair. And in the last 10 seconds, there is a third way, which is not related to the recognition, but it is a formula, which is the basic universal income. And that is a trick to see if we can continue with the conversation. Well, there are many topics to address. And it's amazing to see the percentage of the GDP that is accounted for work that is conducted by women, unpaid domestic work and care work. How do you see it, Paloma? There are so many different concepts that were given by Claudia and Paula when they talked about the time usage, how women devote their time to this, and how do you see it from the foundation? Me escuchan bien? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. So I would like to put in context that, of course, the presentation from Carolina, it's no chance that I am participating from the associations precisely, because as we mentioned, the set of Chile 2015 me and my family into a clearer family. So, from the evidence, it is that we gather uh, well, well, with our bodies that are completely spent and tired, we raise this demand from civil society to, of this feminization of care and how, facing the question that you were asking and the, all of the questions from our partners in the panel, how do we leave behind this? First, how do we acknowledge the labor of care in the current model and where we acknowledge only the productive work and the reproductive work that we do is completely turned invisible and it is uh, blocked in the four walls in households. So I believe that is the first step. Second step without a doubt is that we need to acknowledge who we are. We need to know and acknowledge who we are. We need, we need to move forward to um, a survey of who are the carers, who do we care for, where are we, what is the educational level we have, the social level, how do we live? How do we? How did our lives change after becoming carers? Without that survey, we cannot move forward in any way. I believe these are two fundamental things. So, some other things that for us are very important is to stop romanticizing the work that we do. Stop thinking that because it's an act of love, because we, of course we do it with love, and maybe the the person 
we care for the person the most. But we need to progress in the acknowledgement of this work as as a job, as a job that we use our lives in and that needs to exist some sort of preparation. It's not enough with the three R's that were mentioned by the partner, but also we require reparation because we have some partners that have been caring for many years, maybe 30 years, and the bodies are, are, are spent. They require some sort of reparation. An income, while it does help, without a doubt, an income puts us in a situation of continuing maintaining the condition of caring, continuing being locked, I mean, just staying at home, basically. So how do we progress towards women to continue developing ourselves in all of these aspects and not perpetuating the labor of, of care uh, through an income that, without a doubt, is a contribution and it's quite supportive, but it's not a real solution. I would be left with that from the civil society, from the evidence with that analysis, I would say that we need to progress to the acknowledgement that we feel we already did is reparation. We talk about yeah, four years ago, we, would, we didn't used to talk about that, but we need to progress towards public policies that are concrete so women can go to society deciding whether or not we want to to be carers regardless of the degree of dependency of the person who is being cared for thank you very much paloma for those approaches from that acknowledgement, from the experience. And I believe we're here left with several ideas from this first block. We have the acknowledgement, the importance of the service, who are the carers, who is cared for, and also the concept of reparation, what I, which I find very relevant. And that also talks about people, mainly women, that for many years have been carers. That without a doubt has generate some partners and a type of life that is very different to the life of other people that inhabit the national territory. With that reflection, we go to the context, to the current context. With a question, maybe we can address from the feminist standpoint, how do you believe this topic of domestic work and the labor of care should be added in the new constitution and the state institution. So we are in a constitutional process nowadays uh, with parity, it's a process where feminism is included. And here we find in the second round for presidential elections. So how do you imagine, how do you envision this is addressed from the executive power and also from the constitutional logic? Paula. I think we have two ways in which we could include this. On the one side, as a principle, and then as a duty of this state. As a principle, I believe our new constitution or new drafting of the rules of society should include the principle of responsibility of care. We cannot go back to assume that our society will place the responsibility of care in women. I don't believe that's right. And the state, as Paloma was saying, should acknowledge the work of care on the one side as an activity that is productive. Because as Claudio was saying this, this is the work of care that allows that all of the other works can be done. So everyone can have a, a suitable rest so they can be nourished and dressed and leave their houses in optimal conditions to study or work. It is thanks to the fact that this work was done. So the state should integrate it our country should integrate it in their new constitution. 
We believe it's important, this, uh, because this will allow to provide guidance for public policies that can be later visibilized and produce and distribute, redistribute both men and women, but also among the state places and communities. So this acknowledgement enables the possibility of making a number of transformations in the other normative bodies. The possibility of investing in infrastructure and in services for care for all of the people of all ages in the work environment to do it in, in ways that effectively allow for a work code where we protect fatherhood and motherhood in conditions of equality, progress in social protection policies. So all of the expansion that needs to be done of the current subsystem of support and care. So in fact, all of the population will have a right to be cared and carers also have the right to, to share with the state that labor. And as we were saying, everything that needs to be done in terms of the provision system, all of those forms would be enabled if the Constitution has acknowledged this work as a work that contributes to a social and political growth. I have a couple more seconds and I would like to go, uh, I would like to extend myself on the fact that this principle of of the co-responsibility, social co-responsibility, will also enable an organization that is fairer for care. So what we've said is that currently we live a crisis of care because they do, it does no longer resist this organization, this organization, this organization that lays on the shoulder of women the responsibility of care. Thank you very much, Paula. Um, I'd like to remind all of the people that can send in their questions, their, their appreciations, their comments on the chat. And also tell you that we see that image of Paloma only because she's from a region, she doesn't have good internet connection. So same question for Paloma. So how do you take care from civil society? How do we take care of this, Paula, saying crisis of care from the perspective of the public institution and from public institutions. Well, we came to the assembly with the main mission of putting care at the center, at the center of life, center of public policies, at the center of our society, through a change of paradigm. How do we people relate? How do we acknowledge the labor that is done in their majority? women uh, in households. So that has been our mission within the assembly to see care as a social pillar, as a big umbrella of all of the social demands where well, care it's multi-dimensional, it's cross-sectional, it goes through all of the sectors. When we understand it like that, we, need to understand, we also understand that care needs to be acknowledged and needs to be set as a priority. Not only in this new constitution, but in all of the public policies that are being done, in all of the topics, because if we talk about care, we talk about health, we talk about care, we talk about education, we talk about the environment, we talk about women, childhood, we talk about the elderly, we talk about everything when we talk about care. So when we understand that and we put that at the center as that thing that gives us well-being, quality of life to all, all of us as human beings, we can progress towards the society where public policies protect 
women. So, because of that, I remember that when we started the campaign of Mariela, which is the founder of the of our association, we thought of a consignment, and this was for a state that cares. And this has been our focus. And well, from civil society, we have a hope that the process focuses in this process and that we're going to have a government that will have the same outlook of a caring state, a comprehensive state, a state that cares for people. And I believe that that is fundamental from the feminist standpoint. We always talk about nothing of us, nothing about us with actors, and I believe that is what we're achieving now from the new constitution. We are there, we are caring, talking about care as part of public policies, and I believe that that has been this new look and this acknowledgement has been fundamental in the visualization of care already exists. So how do we progress to make this concrete, this reparation and this change of social paradigm of this new way of relating ourselves with the care at the center? So I think that it's fundamental that both the new constitution that was going to be uh, including care as a new government hand in hand, we can progress towards a national system of support of comprehensive care that will go through all of social demands. Thank you very much, Paloma. Claudia. As a former minister with an institutional view from the executive power and now as elected senator, it is very relevant because we understand that the constitution changes, we will give us a new chart, but we need to open a cycle of transformation for the executive power with laws that accommodate the new constitution. And how do you see that we take care of the care from the constitution from the institutional level as a country? Well, the first thing is that I, I totally agree with what Paola and Paloma said. I believe the power of the expression of the proposals of the way of highlighting care that Paloma was saying, I believe is very relevant. Uh, I believe it's very good because it's a revitalization for so the discourse of public policy, sometimes public policies end up debating, and especially when you need to go discussing with those who are the decision makers, the economic decision makers, they talk about very technocratic aspects. And here, from the deep emotion, the deep day-to-day uh, -day life that here is. And I believe that, at the very least, I hope that public policy is, becomes ever more human, ever more humane, and that it is that doesn't comply with technical topics necessarily because we need to finance this very well. So it goes where it needs to go. And so people feel that this public policy will change the reality of their lives, but it should be thought from these objectives, as Paloma was saying. I believe that is very irrelevant. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, we're stuck in this sort of arguments that are a bit removed from the feelings and the emotions that are the ones that really are involved. Why do I say this? Because before answering this question that we were asking, because I was in a forum a month ago, before the first round, and how to change it, with the representatives from the current uh, team of the far right wing 
far right, right wing candidate that was talking about the healthcare professionals. Um, well, she said that we could agree on many things, but when we were saying that we need to change the, this patriarchal way that is seen in the distribution of the roles and tasks among people where women have been carrying the heaviest load, the car that makes us invisible, that tires us and makes us work twice or triple and so on and so forth. And that is what it implied to have not only that acknowledgement from the economic way and the remunerations, and I, I very much agree with what Paloma was saying. As Paolo was saying, it needs to express a, a national care system and not only pay the CARA because otherwise we perpetuate that system. And she was answering like, yeah, 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 but it doesn't matter. Women can do everything. That today in Europe, especially in Spain, regarding the, the situation of care work, and in that situation or from that perspective, the proposal, or there is a certain level of tension between expanding a public care system with the different instances they exist daycare centers, etc., in comparison to paying or giving a, a financial contribution to women that perform that work. So from that perspective, I feel that it is something that we have to pay attention to as a country because maybe we could follow that debate and bring it onto our country. And I think listening to Paloma and Paula, definitely we have to uh, have a national care system with different instances for or to fulfill the different needs of people to incorporate women as well in those uh, cases where they need a certain support for instance a number of uh, hours free a week or hours off and those that need to carry out paid labor outside the household so from that perspective, there are different ways of going about it. We we're just listening to Claudia. And we do a, a gathering of the topics that we've gathered. Paula was talking about a care crisis. Paloma was talking about um, justice of a work that has been historically been laid upon women, which is care, that has not been acknowledged, not socially, not in terms of economy, um, not in economic terms. Claudia would like to highlight talks about differences that exist in Chile between Boric and uh, the other candidate and how many times we perpetuate this uh, patriarchal role in the distribution of work that has meant stress and has meant excessive work on the bodies of women that it has in summary Today is one of the labors that we have, not only for feminism, but as a society in general. We need to take care of that. The concession process uh, has an as a central objective to take care of the structures and patriarchal order that are not only underlay the structure of our country, but we know it's a world phenomenon. But from that phenomenon is that the different areas of feminism is that many women that are panel members have been standing up strong to work on these topics. Paula, from the study, from the academic, uh, from the centers of study, so they have been capable of accounting for what it means in economical terms at work, Claudia, from the institutions, but also from her political work as an elected senator today, and Paloma, thirdly, from civil society, from the experience of a caring family that is very relevant when we need to understand how to make public policies, because we know that everything fails when you don't understand the emotion and the problems in the social problems, and with that reflection, we wanted to go to the third question, and this question is very much linked to civil society and the constitutional process. So how do we imagine in the future that civil society and the people are participating of um, 
of a national caring system. And we dream that it could be executed at a um, national level. And also, we participate in the constitutional process that we are now living. So let's start with Paula. I, I don't think there's any other option. Well, I believe that, well, two things. Regarding the participation in the convention itself, well, Paloma already said this, and, and we have boys and vote in the right wing. So care will be uh, highlighted by Marina Sade and other members of the constituents. But we know that other conventional had all also a highlight of this among their main proposals for the campaign to be elected. But we also have the possibility of popular initiatives. And here we have two ways of participating. One is generating a popular initiative of norms, where we have all of the instructions clearly giving in the convention site and also supporting the initiatives that have already been generated and that are linked to acknowledgement of care, uh, responsibility of, and the, the sharing of responsibility. We need to say something important. We need to care for the votes of popular initiatives because you cannot vote for all of the initiatives there are. You need to vote for up or top seven. So I would highlight, I, I would recommend to wait until we have all of the elected initiatives uh, present and define how would you like to distribute your seven votes because otherwise you might regret it of voting uh, for one thing or the other and you need to make a reflection there to decide on your vote. And the other thing is how do we participate in this system? So it depends on who wins. If Gabriel Boric wins, myself as a responsible for that team, I can guarantee that these are designed and the proposal of care contemplates that in the governance of the system, we have the participation of all of the organizations and, of course, the organizations of carers. Evidently, for us, the, the deconcentration of power is one of the principles of the program and also the local belonging. We know that we do not have we don't have anyone who's better than the people who are affected by public policies that can guide us in how to provide them. So we can have spaces for for the organizations of people at a certain level of dependency and people who are carers can participate on this. Thank you so much, Paula. We are having a conversation regarding the ways how the different civil society organizations and people can become a part not only of the constitutional process, but also of a future care system. And Paula was talking about the popular initiatives for the constitution. And there are several innovations in comparison to what has happened in other countries in the world. It is an equal convention. There were 17 seats that were reserved for certain groups and one of the most direct mechanisms for participation is this popular initiative where one regulation is discussed by uh, the constitutional uh, convention or part of it when it gathers 15,000 signatures. And I think it is a process that has never been seen before regarding participation to get to the constitutional discussion directly with the support of different people. And it also bets on the um, need of having signatures from at least four regions. So all these emotions or concepts or ideas that are presented have to be relevant for the entire country. So Claudia, how do you think the civil society is becoming a part of the constitutional process and also part of a potential government or administration with the national care system in place? Now, in relation to the issue of the civil society associations, I believe that it is quite a challenge in this issue and in many others to incorporate the voice 
from the source of what's going to happen in the convention, in the constitutional convention, and, and thanks to the member of the constitutional convention, SEDE, as well as others, because they're going to be following this in the discussion of the convention themselves, but we also need other voices to be present in the legislation process and in the creation of public policies. Now, from the perspective of public policies, we need more homogeneous instances and we need higher flexibility because there are so many different realities when it comes to the care work and the care workers themselves are very, very uh, diverse. So the same instance or a help or support may not serve everyone the same. And if you apply it to different regions, for instance, or different areas of a city, it may be different for some people and it may serve some people but not everyone because every case is different especially considering the territories the different identities of course they have to be all the support systems have to be put in place considering of course the approach of different identities and the voices of care workers and the voices of people that are cared for have to be considered as well because they are subjects who are entitled to their rights some weeks ago, on December, the Constitutional Convention was requested by groups of people with disabilities to be recognized as sub subjects fully entitled to their rights instead of subjects to be served by charities. So I think these are two key issues to consider, not only to address this in the constitutional process, not only in the laws that have to be drafted in order to establish the proper care system, but also in the operation itself of such a national care system with an approach or with the purpose of overcoming this sexist logic, this sexist division of labor that has women exploited, physically exploited, emotionally, psychologically, and of course, it has put over the shoulders of women a responsibility, which is huge, which is also a reproduction in our society when in reproduction of human beings, there isn't only the participation of one person, because I always say this and it might not be the nicest example, but it has to be clear for everyone. Women don't just uh, cut off a finger and a baby appears. There is the participation of two people and not only two people for humans, there is an entire society where we are a part of and for that there needs to be support there needs to be co-responsibility in the support of life so we demand this from the feminist perspective and also above all from the perspective of our daily activities and our daily lived experiences for women overall and more specifically women who are care workers and caregivers and i believe that the democracy of our country and the changes that have to happen in our political system are absolutely necessary and they need to incorporate the voices of the trade unions of the civil society organizations of all types we cannot longer continue with a representative democracy there needs to be an equal democracy with direct participation with the mechanisms for instance the popular initiative of norm, the popular initiative of law with different public consultations that are binding, they all have to be mechanisms that have to be available for us to improve our public policies, to improve our legislation and to improve our democracy. Thank you so much, uh, Claudia, for the elements that you were able to share with us. And I want to go back to your last comment that has to do with the democracy. How do we move from a representative democracy to a participative democracy? And how do we do this with an equality approach or feminist approach? Many people have talked about what would be an equal democracy like. How do we achieve parity in the different institutions of the state? The 
judicial power, the executive power, and so on and so forth. And without a doubt, it doesn't only acknowledge women in their different uh, scopes of action in the public life, but it also opens up the discussions because we know that the recognition and the representation were already topics that, that are not as effective when there are only men. But Paloma, from the civil society, how do you see the role that you play as well as other uh, organizations of the civil society in the constitutional process and also in the potential implementation of a national care system? Well, for us, this is key. I think that part of the great social crisis that we have gone through has to do with this idea of not listening to one another, of not not doing policy with the people who are actually affected and leave the different experiences and the different realities throughout the country. And that led us to a huge social crisis that today led us to the actual discussion of a new constitution. Well, we have already heard about different instances for participation. I just think we also need to include public hearings because they've also been a way of involving the civil society in the process, in the constitutional process. However, for us, it is key to put in place a change so that everything but everything that is written into the regarding public policies has the involvement of the people who are actually impacted. That is key. That is something that needs to be done. And it has to change in that way. And I would like to stop to mention a couple of things that Claudia said, because I believe they are key with relation to how, until now, uh, we have been making uh, policies and how to move towards the changes that we want to see. I was listening to to the comments and when you go knock on the door of a family and there is a care worker believe me behind each door you have a different reality so you can't just put in place a national care system without considering all the different variables without considering that behind each closed door behind each territory in each city you will see different realities this year we worked with a network of care worker support and one of the things that i can highlight from the central team is that is to listen to the huge differences that there are between one family and the next and the different needs that they have so if we don't listen to the people that leave these situations we won't be able to move forward we won't be able to create effective public policies because they won't be based on reality. And it's very different. We may study so much about different topics, but trust me, when you live it in first person, when you live it yourself, the way you used to see things changes, changes immediately. And everything you thought you knew is completely destroyed and shattered away and you start seeing a completely different reality. You start seeing things differently. And that is what public policies need to uh, be translated into. That is why what Paula was saying is very important to incorporate in the future administration, the civil organizations, and that from the baseline, we are able to say, what is it that we need? How do we need it? And when do we need it? That is key. Without that, there is not a chance we're going to build a fair country, a country that actually puts the dignity of people at the core. So from the civil society, I really like to hear both uh, Claudia and Paula from their different positions that they are willing and convinced of creating a new way of engaging in politics. 
Thank you so much for that, Paloma. There are so many things that are very important. The reality of each family, of course, each woman who is a care worker, they're all different because they live in different places, because there are cultural differences, there are financial differences, and without a doubt, that is something to consider when it comes to creating public policies and changing institutional organizations. So we're done with the questions. Thank you so much. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for your comments. And, and I was just talking about all the questions and all the comments that we got. So I'm going to be mixing comments and questions because I think that there are comments that are very important. I don't want to leave them aside. We have a comment here. Until the state doesn't acknowledge the impact of the care work to the um, economic situation of the country, nothing will happen. Everything will just be words. Paula Toledo says, I am a mother of two children. One of them has autism. I am, a, in, I am an engineer. I am a public worker. I worked half a day, but with a salary of one third. I went back to working full time and I have to pay a person to care for my child, but I want to show and give visibility to those that have to have double presence. Just like Paloma said, it, there are so many women that nowadays are trying to have a full time job, a paid labor with their care work. And regarding that, I'm going to ask two questions and then I will ask a third one because there are very interesting questions. The first one is the following. What are the cultural changes that China needs to move towards a shift in the system? And then we have Margarita asking, well, first of all, very good meeting. Thanks to the panel members. How can the state become an agent of co-responsibility of care? to generate instances of greater agency of the caregivers and also what is the role of the community. So I'd like to open the floor to answer to those questions and let's start with Paula. Paula, the floor is yours. Well, regarding the cultural shift, there is so much to do, and I think it is necessary from the Constitutional Convention that they address this. It is key that that we have education for this, education that has a gender approach, education that is not sexist, education that allows us to educate children and the youth for them to be free of the gender stereotypes and roles that put us in boxes. For that, it is key to have something that nowadays just doesn't exist in the universities. Well, I won't say fully absent, but I would say that it exists, but it's not a part of the different programs of education in Chile. In Chile, teachers and also students that are trained to become a teacher, they are not trained with a gender perspective, so no one nobody realizes the biases that we are not aware of precisely because everything that society tells us is sexist so until someone unveils that and it explain it to you and it makes sense to you only then you start looking at things with a feminist perspective and only then you realize how sexist everything around us is and still in our country and this is fully documented in different studies in different um, standardized tests that show that there are many teachers out there, regardless of their gender, that still believe that women are inherently bad at math just because they're women. So there is so much to unveil and there's so much to do there so that from the 12 years that we spent at school, we need to 
we need to have an upraising who an upbring an upbringing that is uh, free of stereotypes that would allow us to have future generations that are committed to core responsibility i think that education is key for a cultural shift and on the other hand all the regulation because we always think about what comes first is it the regulation or is it the cultural shift i believe that changes in the regulation would push cultural shifts so there is something there to be done and to use at this moment in Chile, the labor regulation is a regulation that goes over so many other regulations because, precisely because, it's putting in place inequalities between the workers. The workers in Chile, male workers, they don't have the right to care. They do not have the right to care, and women do which is something good because no one would want it to be otherwise because but since it is uneven men are hired more relatively speaking women are more expensive to have as workers and that brings along a difficulty to have an employment a lower salary and of course the gender pay gap that we all know of so if from the regulation we say that men and women have the right to care well in that sense it will be more natural that men and women for instance have a maternity or paternity leave or that women have access to the right to feed their children that they have a daycare available that they take a medical leave if their children below one year get sick and some countries that are more advanced in terms of the parents you see if you go to the park you will see men walking around with their babies going to the medical appointments and so on and so forth so it becomes part of the daily life that men and women care for children equally and without a doubt that changes the culture thank you very much paula how do you see it Claudia. Well, I agree on several topics here because I believe the first thing is the cultural changes that Chile requires are deep changes and that goes um, generating a number of transformative communication messages from public policies, from the new constitution, from the new different agents for transformation of our societies. So without a doubt, these messages always need to show of a new relationship between the genders and determine. I am sorry, there's a lot of noise in the background. So and from that perspective, we finished those messages where we made very natural and we romanticize the what Paloma was saying, all of the tasks of care and all of the domestic tasks. So even we naturalize them to a point that you need to even explain to some people that women don't have a gene to do dishes. You do it because we were taught uh, from an early age, even all of the maternal care that seem to be, we've always tried to be explained that it's very intuitive. It's not so intuitive. Some things uh, have been trained in us since we were given our first doll. Well, girls were giving a doll and boys weren't. So these are topics that you need to address differently. So I totally agree with non-sexist education to do that, not only to transmit this to boys, girls, and the youth, but we need to train teachers in this gender or uh, in this gender perspective. But I believe also so some other agents are very important, such as how do we train our transformative gender perspective to everyone? Because the communication messages of uh, advertising agencies are very disturbing about this concept of how do we set the differences for men and women? How has this been taught to us that men and women are complementary? 
Well, no, the only space where we are really complementary is in reproduction. In everything else, we are each 100%, we're a whole. I don't need someone to go to work or to do dishes. They don't, I don't need a man to do dishes for me, to go to work for me. And the other way around, the same. The only thing that we are complementary in is reproduction. So this fake imagery that we are like the half of the other, a half of a whole, all the time that has to do with these false ideas of romantic love you love the other of course you want to fall in love and from the, uh, of whoever you want to fall in love but you don't lose yourself when you fall in love you don't stop being yourself so i believe these are fundamental messages and uh, the media also what they can do in this you build realities all the time and you can generate a great contribution to this cultural transformation fight lies that have been installed not only in chile but they're installed as a world trend of talking about the ideology of gender which is a just so it's just a fallacy uh, it is not an ideology, it's not invented. This is just an analysis and these are perspectives to understand the differentiated roles that we have been given to both men and women throughout history and in our societies to understand this structural topic and structuring topic of inequality, which is this. And, and that's what it is. It's not more than that. It's nothing out of the ordinary. So on the other side, we also need to acknowledge brighter legislation that would allow to so chair and co-responsibility among boys and girls. And also with the state, Chile today has two, which is healthy law that includes the siglis for for people who are, uh, for, for your boys and girls, uh, for, for the sons younger than 15 that have serious diseases or are bedridden and all of everything else regarding uh, parental care which is negotiable with the mother is not exclusive for the father it is based on the on the maximum of the mother's income not on the father's well there's a lot of deficiency here that need to be improved uh, as Pablo was saying and also how can we be an agent of the responsibility of the state and the communities from the mental first because of everything that we said in the previous question that has to do with the design of the care system and implementation through some devices but also but as um, uh, incorporating of the tasks. So when you break the logic of individualism that we have so deeply rooted in our country and you generate a space for recomposition of the social fabric and the community and make it participative and a main player, not only the formulation, but, all of the, but also the proposals for the implementation of public policies, but you also make it participative and a main player of the reproduction of life of human beings, which is where we make sense again to communities, again in this economic crisis because of the pandemic and the bad and the poor management of the government. So again, when we have the ollas comunes, which are the common pots on all the images of solidarity from the community, when we say, you know what, we don't need to come alone when we have earthquakes, when we have a fire, when we have a, situ a bad economic situation as we've lived, we need our communities to be every day Every day of the year, we need them to be solidary and key in the reproduction of each one of us and human beings have, by grace and disgrace, we have the exception that we don't live alone and we do not survive alone and therefore we need one another. And that for me is fundamental because I believe that Public policy cannot continue to be conceived as a service and as a tool and devices that are provided individually to the person that requires care in this case, or to support that woman do it, that is receiving care. But we need to take into account that we are communities, and also we need to be we need devices that allow for the support um, in these communities for a better exercise with this. That's all.
Thank you very much, Claudia. So many topics, the incentives and the, and the negative incentives for women in the labor work because of care. So we talk about post-natal care that is so wished by children women because we know the difficulties that it is to bring, uh, to give birth and raise a child and the labor uh, deficiencies that that means. We also talk about fighting, fighting lies, stereotypes and sexes, education. We've all lived that by, in one way or another. Aloma, how do you see from I care and from your cuido, the cult necessary cultural change that we need as a country and as a world? And what is the role of the state and how can we manage, how do we achieve this? Uh, this uh, social co-responsibility, what they communities have in bed. Well, for us, we've always said that we require profound changes, changes in the paradigms of the social paradigm. And for that, we require that we have um, a deep change. And how do we manage to get this change? First, having grown in this patriarchal system, in this capitalist system, how can we progress towards women first? I can imagine prácticamente para 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 criar entonces eh, para criar, para cuidar, para lavar los platos, para cuidar, para cuidar, uh, to wash dishes. And when you ask a woman, do you work? Uh, no, I'm only um, a, a housewife. Yes, you work in domestic work. You work in, in you work in care. And to change from there, as in first instance, um, to see how we were raised in this system that buried women, it is a big challenge. Um, after that, uh, progress in a non sexist education. And uh, education is fundamental from the first childhood where we progress uh, towards these deep changes of our society, where we stop, where women stop being the ones that are designated for certain tasks and men for others. That clearly put us at a disadvantage at all times but and how do how do we progress towards core responsibilities that is so necessary so going encounter ourselves after what happens uh, after the social outburst look at each other's eyes live in a community again and as Claudia was saying when well, we started caring for an, an others because we are interdependent beings and we started living in other ways. We started opening up to the community, to live as a community, to care as a community, and get the care from households, from from the individuality, uh, and being rem and removing ourselves from that from that individuality we were pushed into. So those are keys. Those are keys for this process. It's very important process that we're living as a society after um, this uh, social outburst of going back to being a community, building as a community, and from that way, from that unique way, care becomes uh, community-based. 
we're gonna have the reality of the community care so both people who receive care and people that give care and their environment because we cannot be left as claudia was saying in this uh two dimension the carer and the person who receives care because we have an environment we have a family that also is affected and we also have a community that could be participating if we learn how to build as a community because it's not only that the state should be co-responsible of, of care but as a society everyone needs to be taking part of this thank you very much paloma i'm going to be asking one last question but i'm going to be receiving some um some interesting comments so they should be worked as a boys and youth learn how to cook i think is yeah, that would be brilliant for many families in Chile and around the world. Blanca says, I am a mother, I'm a mother and a care and I had to quit my paid job. The problem is regional and we need to look at that as the big network we are. If you strengthen this at a regional level, we cannot go back. Patricia Pacheco, teacher from nursing. Sadly, we have, we're lacking a lot of training for women that are caring for the elderly because of not having resources, they cannot have access to uh, a home. I've seen the, the women of these women and every time I've really wanted to train them, even as volunteers, we get doors closed. That is told by Patricia. We go with some questions. We go with Jorge Neira from Madrid. He says, I praise the organization of this event and the organization of the Chilean citizenship. Great of luck and a lot of encouragement from my side. So, what about a care? Do you contemplate a, a public based caring systems? Do you work in the implementation of equality in Chilean society or as it is it's just an intention? That is. And we have another question of Marcela Fuentes. I believe that there is a clear consensus of acknowledgement of the labor of care as work that should be paid. The point is how can you quantify and establish a wage for that, for that work? I leave you with those interesting questions and, and we're going to start with Claudia. So on the national system of care that is public, uh, I believe, without a doubt, that we are at times where we can always, where we can't always have a co-responsibility, not only the community, but I believe also the employers, they need to have a co-responsibility in terms of care. All of the previous examples that Paula said in the previous answer, not only in what corresponds to the legislators in terms of greater, better laws, but also matters of a change of outlook of, of the paradigm from the labor work and in this case of our employers to not continue thinking quote unquote, that it's more expensive to hire women, but in fact, we need to make a co-responsibility and generate um, that the rights of care is both for men and women. And it goes uh, by incorporating and, and adding the public world, the private world, sorry, to the situation. But it's fundamental that a state different to the one that Chile has today, a state that is absolutely subsidiary, a state that is extremely neoliberal, goes to be a state that grants social rights, a state that goes, uh, that uh, it's a caring state. And from that perspective, we need to have a very important role in the national system of care. It is not the only thing, but we need to have a, a main role in that because of coverage that requires to be national, requires to be at the level of all of the diverse, needs to be diagnosed both in the interventions and by the conception of the university that tells you of the right to be cared for and the right to care and the right of carers. And that is guaranteed effectively by the public system. In this case, the conception of public policies is by the state. So, and of course, this is a very important 
push that from the state we should be summoning companies, employers to have these changes in their outlooks, uh, in their visions. So that is completely feasible, but I believe it is a fundamental role that should be played from the point of view of the state and the public system. Chile, nowadays, we've seen several cultural changes despite all the way we have to go. We have been generating cultural changes that have been very accelerated lately, and therefore a conception or a view of a society that is more equal from the point of view of not only social rights, but especially from the point of view of a transformative gender perspective and a new relationship among genders is the north of the changes that have been produced. So therefore, Chile today, we're not looking for only to have a national system of care. We're looking for having and progressing towards better service and prevention, care, reparation, and a reversal of gender violence and progressing towards having a um, hereditary democracy where progressing, well, in terms of yearning, at least, this government hasn't been very helpful at that, but it's something. But in terms of our yearning, that is what we're talking about as demands nowadays. So our view, it's more towards equality of gender equality than the national system of care that is a huge component to reach that gender equality. And I say this based on the second question that was uh, asked by Carolina and the relationship of how to quantify to obtain, I imagine the question goes that way, to get some income that is as suitable and as dignified as possible based on the a uh, physical and emotional effort and the magnitude of the task that the work of care implies. We have a lot of exercises. The most pertinent to answer this question is, is Pasu, who's an economist. But, uh, but I want to make a very amateur exercise here from specialty. But when you make this exercise only for visibility, visibility and acknowledgement with the communities, and you start telling the communities how much you pay uh, a worker that is a cleaner, how much are they paid, how much is um, an health uh, a technical assistant is paid, how much are food, um, uh, how much are cooks paid at canteens and start adding that and then start looking at all of the tasks that are done from domestic work and all of the work that is done from care and then you add this up and you start making a, an, a, an a calculation it's not of course the sum of all of these incomes because it's a lot more that you could do but you start at least making proportions based on each one of these things you can come to incomes that are very well paid so with that what i want to say is to visualize that there's an undervaluing that is absolutely uh, based on the prejudice from the sexist topics uh, on domestic and care work. When I had as a minister of women and gender equality uh, to talk about seminars with companies, uh, when we started, we were trying to change these mentalities in the labor work. And I, I told them, why is it so difficult for you to assume that it's possible to have equal work and equal pay for men and women? It is not the same because I have two accelerators, the ones that, uh, that serves a coffee and the other one that helps uh, with the locks. Yeah, they, they need to get different income. Yeah, but you're undervaluing domestic work because you believe that serving coffee is not, doesn't take any effort. Because you're so used that at home you are served that way and nobody's charging you for that. Because today women start charging 1,000 pesos for making the beds, 500 for cups that we wash, 5,000 pesos for waxing, even if it's hardwood floors, maybe a bit more. And we go back, if it's one, they start adding that. And then you say, okay, okay, this is, this is work, isn't it? So there's an undervaluing of all of the work that women do, especially on what is coming from the world of the domestic work and care that means that in the labor market, we it's continue to be undervalued. So why the workers uh, are the ones that have the lowest income in general in the country? 
because we're told that for that you don't even require qualifications because women are born on how to care for babies cooking and cleaning so it has to do with that view so it has to, quantify has to do with two exercises the one that is more specialist that Magda can talk about and others with changing the view of valuing social valuing of these tasks and these tasks are hugely relevant they are exhausting i always say the example of anyone who doesn't believe it do it from monday to sunday from seven onwards if not earlier and tell us how are you doing at 11 pm are you tired or not and how many men discovered that the house chores they were doing work from home uh, in the pandemic and they discovered house tasks and they discovered that they were tiresome and that is what we're missing. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia, so much. Also, the stereotype of not needing any type of qualification to do that work. I think about that when I think of cooking, because just meet someone that doesn't know how to cook and see how they prepare lunch. And of course, you can tell that it requires work and learning and skills. So I fully agree with everything that you've mentioned. Paloma, what do you think about this? How do you think that salary should be calculated to pay for care work and how public should be the care system that we need to put in place or that we want to put in place? Well, first of all, I think I'm going to repeat many of the things that our colleagues said earlier. I fully agree with them, but I just want to put context to the care work that we carry out for you to understand that we don't want to be trained. We don't want to be trained as care workers. And we don't want to learn more. We don't want to be a physical therapists. We don't want to be nurses. We don't want to be cooks. We want to be mothers, grandmothers, children. And from the moment we were turned into care workers, we stopped fulfilling those roles and we stopped being mothers and daughters and grandmothers and we started becoming care workers getting up at 6 a.m to do cleaning uh, to give uh, medication to whoever needs it to feed people through a tube and at this moment in chile they would just say okay this is a person these are the conditions and that's it you need a number of devices and you're lucky if they explain to you how to use the devices to care for someone and that's all we get and we don't want to go on with that we want to have a good quality of life we want professionals to do that work we don't want to do it anymore we don't want to receive training to continue doing so to continue exhausting our bodies that is the reality that we live on a daily basis where behind each door you would see different realities and there are different care workers that do get up at 6 a.m. and they go to bed at 3 a.m. If they ever go to sleep, they only get three hours and that long is the day and that exhausting is the day that they have to live on a daily basis and that is something that no one can stand. But after that, you won't have one dependent person, but after years, you will have two people that will need care. But who will do that? The state doesn't do that. There isn't a community, there isn't an extended family. Ultimately, care workers are left on their own. Women, they're left on their own with the other person they have to care for. And there aren't any networks. And if we want to, and if we continue to think that women have to do this, and if we want to train women, if we want to uh, show them how to better do that work. I insist it helps. Yes, it does, but it's not the ultimate solution. And I would like to highlight that. How do we quantify the economic value of this? Well, that's something that maybe Paula as an economist could help us with. I'm sure that she is better qualified than I am, but the way that I see it, it is so difficult because the work is so exhausting. It is a work which is 
which is physically exhausting, emotionally taxing on you with no social security whatsoever. You don't have uh, social or health care insurance. We don't have mental health assistance to support caregivers. So how do we even quantify all of that? If we take it to a number, I'm sure that it would be a number that no state would pay. So how do we get to something that is dignified for people and that and that is feasible to be translated into good quality of life for care workers. While I was listening to Claudia, I was thinking that, yeah, we're going through so many changes now. And I think that society itself, it is aiming at having gender equality and going through very deep, profound changes. But for that to happen, it has to go hand in hand with the institutionality of course in a system of support and care the state needs to be the first entity responsible for guaranteeing the social rights of people that are cared for and care workers and when we talk about the participation of private entities there's always this fear how far can you involve the private entities in the system, when are we going to to get rid of this capitalist system? When are we going to move on from this system that we're so used to, that hurts us so much? When are we going to leave it behind? When are we going to have our rights uh, fully respected? I think that the state needs to be the main player in this case, and we have to be very careful in how private entities are involved. I'm sure they have to be involved, but we have to be cautious with that in order to live behind the current system that we are living in without turning care work into a commodity, without um, without just paying another woman to care for someone so that the main care worker is able to be employed again. But once again, there is another woman, just a different woman who is going to be in that position, who is going to be a care worker, and we're going to pay her, yes, but how much are we going to pay her without uh, decreasing her quality of life? Because we know that the person who is going to be doing the work at the end of the day, paid or unpaid, it's going to be a woman. So how do we prevent harming the quality of life of that person? So that is something that I want to put on the table. I think we have to think about that as well when the national care system is put in place and also in the future of public policies that would address this issue without a doubt uh, that will be the case in the future. Thank you, Paloma. Thank you. What about, uh, thank you for that comment regarding what about the mental exhaustion, the psychological, the emotional work. Sometimes we don't consider that and it is definitely important for everyone Paula, what do you think about these uh, questions from the audience? What would you say? Paula, I'm sorry, your microphone is muted, I think. There we go. I'm so sorry, I'm sorry. I just wanted to explain how we did the calculation of the contribution of uh, domestic care unpaid and care unpaid labor to the GDP. The, well, we did a number of calculations, but the one that we have been communicating publicly is that one that was uh, the result of a survey in the market to see the pay rates of different care work, because this is unpaid work when it's done by a person in the family, the person that lives there. But if another person does it, we have to pay that person, of course, and we know the rates in the market how much it costs to care for children, how much it costs for elderly people, beds, uh, watering the plants, doing laundry, cleaning the house, etc., etc. All the different works 
that the survey of use of time measures have a rate which is known in the market. So what we did was to multiply that times the hours that were spent during the different activities of the domestic and care work. And that is how we got to this 22% of the GDP. The central bank updated recently the calculations for 2020, the year of the pandemic, and it got to domestic and care labor representing 26% of the GDP. It increased this contribution. And I fully agree with the comment of Paloma. If we were to actually count all the work that it means to care for people, especially heavily dependent people, I'm sure that there wouldn't be a payment that was right and fair for that. We're always going to be lacking because that is a work that happens 24 seven, right? There are no vacations, there is no social security, there is no health insurance. It's a work that never stops. Now, what we have done, the work that we have done from the uh, group that uh, is supporting the candidacy, of Gabriel Voric to the presidency is first of all to support a tax reform, to collect taxes, to have resources, to have permanent expenditures and resources. Now, the destination or the allocation of the resources will be given by the pension reform and then the health care reform, but there will be resources available for the national care system as well. Now, the perspective of that, or the objective of that is to move towards what Paloma was saying. The idea is to share the responsibility of the care work with the families. The state, until this moment, has not been fulfilling its responsibility of care work, and we want the state to actually fulfill that responsibility. And how is that going to happen? By offering infrastructure and by offering care services and within the care services, of course, we have what Paloma was saying, which is, which is something key as well, which is people who are going to be available to assist people, which means certain workers that the families will have available to delegate the care work. And most likely during the first instance, it will not be just like Paloma said it, that you're able to fully rely on this uh, people to work for you. But most importantly, there will be a certain level of support in comparison to the current situation that we have in place, which is a system that covers barely 4,000 people, which is below 1% of coverage in terms of what we need. So we're talking about a program which is almost a pilot plan. And we want to expand that massively, always thinking about moving towards universal coverage. We know, though, that that needs a staged uh, progress. We have to go little by little, but that is the future horizon for us. Now, in terms of payment, we fully agree with the comment of Paloma because the payment should be understood or could be understood in some cases as just leaving women within the domestic space. And that is something that we do not want. We want women because there are a number of virtues and that, of course, we want women to be part of the labor market. We want them to be able to go out of their houses to be a part of the public world. And that is not the idea. It's not our objective to just pay women to stay at home and they don't need to leave home and they, they just stay there. That's not the point. Now, what we are trying to promote with all the budget difficulties, of course, knowing that ultimately it is not enough regarding the value that the work has 
we are promoting a minimum salary so these people will become workers that will be part of the social security system so it's going to be a minimum wage for those that are below 60 that care for people that are severely dependent and this is a payment that will be given to those people that for the time being don't have any alternative of carrying out a different paid activity. People who are, and for people who are above 65, then we are going to have the universal basic pension payment that we want to have as a minimum, minimum of 250,000 pesos that will be increased with the savings of each person. Now, we know that this is not enough, but without a doubt, it is more than 10 times what exists now as a payment, which is of early 30,000 pesos. So this, this aims at becoming sort of the compromise that we have found between the, the value and the work that it is to care for someone and this bare minimum, which is a payment that people are granted now. Now, the idea is to work towards a minimum wage, which is of 500,000 pesos. So that is more or less what we're thinking about. And very quickly, regarding the, the co-responsibility and the public system. Co-responsibility is something that that in order to measure co-responsibility, we need to go back to what we talked about at the beginning of the conversation. We need surveys of use of time to follow up how the work is being done. Honestly, I am not feeling optimistic because at least in the analysis that we have conducted from the surveys, for instance, analyzing age ranges, because you get this idea that that people who are younger, they are more equal in their relationships and actually statistics do not show that. So there are many challenges in that issue or in that area and it would be ideal to, to have a data to, to analyze that. Now the plan is to have a public system which is going to be run mainly by the municipalities in the different territories and usually with the municipalities they are usually engaged with the uh, private sector. They usually also work with the civil organization or the civil society organizations and uh, they use the services of the private sector. Thank you so much, Paula. I believe that with those questions and also looking at the future, how to turn this into a national system of care, we want to say goodbye and I want to say thank you, Claudia, Paula, Paloma. Thank you so much for your participation. We are working. There are so many women working from different places working towards having feminist progress for women nationally and globally. And I want to say goodbye with a comment from Veronica Montoffer for you to see the international scope of this instance. And I want to leave you with a final question for you to think about this. And the question is, apart from the three are the trade unions that represent care workers in the world together with a group of feminist organizations that fight for human rights and fiscal justice. We are calling for the recreation of the social organization of care, proposing five R's to recognize to pay, to reduce, redistribute, and to demand. Particularly, the two new concepts are to reward or pay for care work under the four pillars of the decent labor agenda of the ILO and to reivindicate the public uh, care as a responsibility of the state. So that is the final comment with the two, two new concepts that come from outside the continent, from feminist organizations, all over the world. I want to thank the Universidad Abierta de Recoleta, the Institute of Local Governments. We are part of the university from for the organization, the Transnational Institute, and also to the attendees. We 
left on the chat box two papers that talk about the Chilean constitutional process, the political definitions that are happening on Sunday in the second uh, round of the presidential election so please read be informed we have to work on all of this not only nationally but also regionally and internationally so once again thank you so much and i hope to see everyone very soon thank you so much and big hugs everyone bye bye everyone thank you La Universidad Abierta de Recoleta is an educational initiative of the municipality to produce, exchange, and distribute knowledge in an innovative way with the ultimate purpose of educating citizens that are critically thinking and that are willing to transform the social reality to generate a country which is more just and loving for everyone. In the framework of the tradition of popular universities that are fully valid all over the world, the university is the first pluriversity of Chile, which is a concept that was created in the core of the social movements, fighting for the recognition of the cultural, historical, sexual, and regional differences that are not represented by the traditional universities. From the very beginning, the university has established a work of collaboration with partnerships with different entities and international organizations. From the moment it was created until today, the university has called upon over 890 volunteer professors and over 95,000 students from Recoleta, Chile and 62 countries of the world that have participated in 430 programs, both in person and online. The educational model of the university bets on the pedagogical innovation as the key feature of how it educates through workshops, in-person courses, semi-in-person courses, and also online courses. The university also produces some digital courses in a format that can be downloaded and also available for communities that don't have access to internet. Together with that, the university also promotes the development of research projects in in topics that are of interest for the community through open callings to the entire community. In the same way, the university carries out cultural activities that are fully free of cost and available to everyone, putting teaching research available to everyone to promote a citizen's dialogue. As part of the process of strengthening the institution, the university has created institutes in order to become a strategic partner in the generation of public policies for the municipality and also for the country and internationally. The Plurinational Institute is created as an instance for education of content from the First Nations from different perspectives. The Institute of Local Governments focuses on making a contribution towards the local government as well as social territorial organizations of Recoleta, Chile, and Latin America. Finally, the Institute of Disability Inclusion and Care, EDIC, has the purpose of contributing towards the generation of knowledge and public policies to promote inclusion and uh, rehabilitation of people with disabilities, tackling the care systems as well as their visibility at the municipality and national level. From this reality, the Universidad Abierta de Recoleta wants to become a hub for development and exchange of knowledge at the service of the strengthening of the territory and the municipality management at all levels.